live the life you love. Mike, welcome to the show. Finally. <laughs> What's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> doing good. Doing good. So first thing I want to start with, <laughs> you, you, you had uh, posted a post on LinkedIn a while ago. You know where you know where I'm going. Where oh, I know where you're going. You, you had a disagreement <laughs> with me on a conversation I had on a podcast with Alex Bowen. Uh, where yeah. He, where he talked about that there's pretty much nothing we can we can people can do right now that want to get into the music industry and you had a big disagreement with that which i actually have a big disagreement too um and i tend to usually to go and listen to back to it before we talked uh, today and i was like huh i see what i did i kind of just go along and i'm just like a yes 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 guy yeah always. yeah because i make try to make it because well, you're like a host you like host. wanna yeah i don't want i don't want to debate i don't like those shows on, on the news channels where sure. they're yelling well if you shows. disagree with anything i say then feel free to jump in and cut me off okay <laughs> so but what, what i want to do is for for anyone that is a regular listener i want to talk about some things that people can do right now during a pandemic and one of the things i mentioned in that episode is you know every artist needs help like regardless of what level they're at and they may not necessarily need a big time manager because there's if there's nothing to work on there's nothing to work on mm -hmm. but anybody that wants to get be a manager and they can get reps like working with these diy smaller artists so i guess uh i'd love to bounce back and forward some ideas of what are things that people can do right now um to yeah yeah and i think like you know first of all uh a caveat <laughs> is like yeah i love bowen we've had disagreements before uh about <laughs> about uh you know whether you need to be an asshole in the industry or not. Um, <laughs> you could you could guess what side Bone was on. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, there's nothing. It was and it was such a small part of your, like your episode. But I was kind of like it stuck out to me, and I was like, oh, huh, like I just kind of started thinking about it. And um, you know the 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 interesting thing to me that I kind of circled back on is um, is that there's there's really a couple of things at play here. So obviously if you know if you're in live events um things are on pause right now right it's right. it's tough it's it, it really is shitty and mm -hmm. um i've gotten like a lot of messages from people um who you know who just hit me up for advice or whatever it is but who are like what do i do like should i leave the industry should i look for things outside like our events gonna come back um mm -hmm. uh and like, just what do I do now? And so uh, I was really thinking about it, and, and especially after listening to the podcast, and it's, you know, there's there's really a couple of things at play here. And um, I think, you know, this was the point that I was, I was trying to make on, on LinkedIn too, is that, um, yeah, there's, there's two dynamics at play, right? There's the industry right. and there's your discipline, right? right. And, um, and the industry is live events, but your mm -hmm. discipline is, you know, regardless of your title, you know, if you're a talent buyer, mostly doing sales, right. little, little, uh, you know, little accounting. Uh, if you are, you know, if you are marketing like myself, like that is applied to a lot of different uh, industries. It's a discipline that you have. So you could kind of go down the list mm -hmm. and think about how do you develop your discipline even if the industry is on pause and trying to separate those two makes things a little bit more palpable um, mm -hmm. where, you know, if uh, I'll take it, you know, from, from, from my example, like if, if I'm, if you're in marketing, um, then there's a whole bevy of places you can oh, leave yeah. the industry that I, you know, I've left the industry for, for a couple of times in my career. Um, and that's only made me better when I've come back in, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because it gave me additional perspective. It's given me new tactics, new strategies. Um, if you're, you know, if you're a talent buyer and you're trying to wonder what to do, and you know, instead of just kind of sitting around waiting for for shows to come back, um, you, you know, you could go into sales or like um, mm -hmm. there was. Uh, uh, a really, this has nothing to do with really COVID, but it just, it's a good example. Uh, do you know Taylor, uh, Taylor Shoemaker? Name sounds familiar. He, uh, he used to work with, um, with Superfly okay. and uh, Bonnaroo specifically. Actually, I think he used to work at AC Entertainment, uh, but, but on Bonnaroo uh, at a producer level, I think he might have been um, festival director uh, for Bonnaroo. Got it. Um, and, and now, um, now he's he's in insurance 
um, particularly for live events. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was reading, um, I was reading a interview with him actually, I think maybe yesterday, uh, back of house live did, uh, uh, an interview with him, or maybe he did an article for them or whatever, but you know, there's just so many parallels, like stepping outside of like being directly in that industry and stepping into another industry. There's a lot of things that you can do to develop that discipline. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really what I was thinking, you know, if you're, um, you know, if you're in ticketing, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. you could get a lot of skills working for an e-commerce site, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. And looking at how they manage inventory and how they basically build all, all their events, like what's, what are the um, different, you know, different values and fields and how they structure like their, their data flows, right? And things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so really, I kind of thought about it in, in a couple of ways. Um, I really, uh, there was basically, there was a quote uh, that I really liked. I, I think I linked it to there um, from, uh, from e Elon's ex-wife, uh, Justine mm -hmm. Musk. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not gonna read it, but the gist of it was basically that, uh, you know, it was, it was just like a random question on Quora mm -hmm. and somebody was like, how do I become a millionaire? <laughs> you know, uh, and it was like a really broad question that she just randomly answered. And basically what she said is, you know, find something and become a master of it. Mm -hmm. Find something else and become a master of it and figure out how to bridge those two worlds together mm -hmm. in a way that nobody's ever done before. Love that. Um, yeah, and that, that really stuck with me um, where, you know, where it's, it's, it's right. <laughs> you know, I think, I, I think that, um, look, I, I mean, I think the, the, it, it's tough. This industry is really insular and very small. Right. And so I think people probably struggle a lot um, about what to do now that they don't have clear next steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think the, the thing that I've kind of like circled back on is, um, just, you know, leave and develop your discipline, mm -hmm. like leave and get a new viewpoint yeah. and then bring it back <laughs> eventually yeah, when things are up and running. Come back by then. <laughs> if you want to come back, yeah. <laughs> certainly make more money. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, uh, but, but if you do, I mean, I think the, you know, given the pandemic and everything, the thing that I'm like most worried about, and we can, you know, we could probably talk about it in detail later, but uh, is, is kind of the loss of like institutional knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of really, really smart people. And mm -hmm. I think the thing that's gonna have the most permanent uh, fallout for, uh, for our industry at least is people leaving and never coming back and just that knowledge, right. uh, that skill just being gone forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to leaving for a little bit, getting a new viewpoint, you know, mm -hmm. becoming a master of something else and then bringing it back in a way that completely creates new ideas and, and takes things to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's, you know, that's really what's uh, where I was coming from. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, that, that you could do, of course, there's, you know, there's self-education things that you could do, like, you know, for instance, your podcast, which I think you and Bo had talked about, or, uh, you know, promoter 101 things like that right. but you can mm -hmm. take the time to like learn about the industry and everything like that but also and, i would say like, these days actually and clubhouse uh There's which i gotta pick your brain about later okay what, what <laughs> yeah because i gotta pick your brain about that later because okay, uh, yeah i'm on it uh i don't know what i'm doing so okay <laughs> which uh, for a marketing guy probably not a, a good thing to say all that <laughs> <laughs> uh um but but yeah, but like, I think there's a lot of like these educational channels uh, that are, you know, that are really good to have. But at the same time, um, I would put a lot of emphasis on, um, you know, on doing something else entirely, but mm -hmm. doing it in a way that helps you bridge the gap. I mean, I, like, I always keep, uh, or I don't always, but I usually keep a client outside the music industry. Right. Um, and that's, a, because it's fun, um, mm -hmm. usually to like have, you know, like I've, I've done work for marketing work for realtors, um, oh, cool. law awesome. firms, uh, uh, a giant Christmas event uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, 
uh, ads every single time I've just learned something completely different and a mm -hmm. different way that people are doing things and I can reply that back to music and say like, right. hey, you know, like, you know, as a, uh, as a marketer in the music industry, you know, who primarily works with venues and festivals, we don't really necessarily think a lot about uh, SEO or search engine optimization, which is like right. a, a subset of marketing, like a, right. a um, but things like law firms and things like realtors think about that a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is one of their marketing pillars. So do you so, mostly how, SEO work for, for them? For those uh, no, no, I do a variety of work. Um, so, you know, I do like, I'm, I'm helping a, a law firm right now as, as one of my clients and um, I'm their new law firm. They're starting mm -hmm. from little over scratch. It was just an idea. It was a joint venture between two lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, we need a marketing plan built from scratch. So, you know, brands, brand strategy, um, ad plans, um, really just like what cases they want to put forth, what's the messaging they want to put forth, uh, the aesthetic, uh, all the way down to SEO uh, cool. as was one of those. Other, other people, you know, I have done uh, like a more narrow focus uh, on, uh, I'm also helping a, uh, a company called Easy Testing, which mm -hmm. does, um, it's a lot of old music industry vets um, who have shifted gear and are doing COVID testing now, who basically said, okay. like, the operations of a music festival mm -hmm. is, uh, is very similar to COVID testing in terms yeah. of traffic control, scheduling, um, a lot of, like, the operational components. Um, so... You know, so I'm helping them like run some of their digital ads, right? Oh, um, I, I don't know if you posted this or I saw it somewhere, but uh, it, it was in, in re reference to COVID testing and how to, I guess, be more efficient at testing um, people for COVID. And it's like, mm -hmm. just let people from the music industry who are currently all out of jobs, let's just let them run that because we know how to process thousands of people, <laughs> you know, all the time and how to deal with traffic and all that. Just let the music industry yeah. handle it. It's absolutely true. I mean, I think to the point where, um, believe uh there was a public letter written to the administration that was like signed by um ag by yeah, live nation everything basically saying like like let us help with this vaccine distribution the faster right. that everything happens the more the faster we're getting we're going to get back to normal mm -hmm. uh and there's you know there's there's few people that are better equipped <laughs> than, yeah. than, than, than like a team in those in the music industry who really yeah. understand the complexities of like a large scale operation like that. There's a, there's a company named Cora um, out, of, out of California and um, they do a lot of uh, uh, production. I think they do a little bit of fabrication, but they have a, uh, a giant tent warehouse um, in 2019. I, um, I, I helped um, launch a festival called The Beach Life okay. in um, in South California. With like it's like Willie Nelson, Bob Weir, uh, oh, wow. um, three day like type of thing, and they came in and did um, you know did a lot of the site design and the tents and, and everything for it. Um, and I've just been talking to them you know ever uh, since and they started a they were one of the first that I've seen to move right into COVID testing and they've taken all their tents in their warehouses and set up drive-through sites. They already knew all the operations. Um, mm -hmm. And my understanding is that they have like a, a fairly good like side business with doing just that. So. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's yeah. interesting. And going back to, you know, what people can do right now, I like the concept of breaking things down. Like break, so it's not just, okay, yeah, you work in the music industry, but you have a specific skill set. So like, how can you improve that skill set? Because one of the things I wrote down in my notes um, you know, just like to throw some ideas out for the people listening is um, like the ticketing. You had an example for ticketing. And what I always tell my students is, you know, there's box offices, not just in concerts, like sporting events have box offices and they're open right now. Um, yeah. A, a museum, a theater has a box office, a movie theater has a box office. I mean, some of those are probably closed right now, but there's other types of businesses that have a box office and deal with ticketing. So, you know, box office is a great way to get into uh, the, the venue side of a business. And then uh, I listened back to the, the interview I did with Derek Sivers. We talked about him before we started recording. And speaking of skill set, like you can train yourself in coding because Ticketmaster, I mean, there's a lot of coding that's involved. And 
he talked about the three main different types. I know there's plenty of others, but he said for now, don't even worry about those. But HTML, CSS, and then JavaScript, those are in that order is what you should learn coding in. And he said you can learn coding in a day. So for the listeners, I'll throw a link in the in the show notes from Derek Sivers, but it's um it's Sivers or he spells it weird, his website's S I V E uh, period R S forward slash Prague. I'll throw it in the show notes, but it basically tells you how to learn coding really fast. And he likes, you know, it's like a hacker. So he loves how to learn things quickly and efficiently. And he said, everyone should learn how to build their own website from scratch. Um, so I'll throw that's it. That's exactly right. I, w- I would say that like, um, you know, I've been doing, you know, marketing along other things, you know, ticketing, artist management, et cetera, for, you know, for 12 years now. The one thing in my toolkit that I've mm-hmm. like, had at my disposal that it comes in handy over and over and over and over again um is coding and like yeah. I, I i cannot agree more i think it is to be able to navigate you know you see people who are like and this is not at all you know who could take like a couple of like you know two by fours or and just build anything with it right, right. and you're like yeah. whoa <laughs> like, <did> you <laughs> yeah yeah exactly how, how did they like, make it round <laughs> exactly right uh and and uh that's really like i was laughing about it with uh um with my brother because i actually took some of the time to launch uh some venue marketing software um but I was kind of like, I, I just went into the deep end of, of that that whole world of coding and everything. Um, and if it feels like the matrix, <laughs> like, <laughs> like you, once you really like, you know, I've been dabbling in it to help, uh, you know, to the point where it helps in my marketing and, mm-hmm. you know, helps me, you know, get websites up fast and, you know, get emails looking nice and everything like that. Uh, but really kind of diving into it and, and taking a little bit of downtime to sharpen the skill. Like it just, it feels like, anything is possible yeah. now. I'm, I'm Neo in the Matrix. <laughs> I love it, yeah. yeah I mean, not just box hours, right? It opens up so many doors in, in other areas. I mean, the, I think so too. The, it can offer so much more to any kind of business. And then the thing that you, you talked about too is like how many people are going to come come back to the industry, right? What happens if all that knowledge, they develop these other skill sets? Like, mm-hmm. if, like if I learned coding, um, I don't know if I would come back because some coding jobs, yeah. they pay great. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, um, my, my, um, my brother um, ran, a, he was the CTO of a pretty popular like coding boot camp um, mm-hmm. here uh, in New Orleans. And so, yeah, they, you would, you would enroll, I think in like two or three months, you would become good enough at coding to get a high paying job and they would help you mm-hmm. place. Wow. Right? Um, and it's just such a need. It's, it's, um, it's absolutely true. And to your points, like, I can't believe I didn't mention it because yes, I absolutely agree with that. I think it's one of those skills that everybody can have, mm-hmm. um, as well as, you know, like there's, there's related fields, you know, even on, if you're not a marketing person, um, having some marketing skills is going to, are going to help you like oh. in a significant way. Um, absolutely. I would say like my, you know, a lot of, the work or a lot of, I guess, the, like the comfort that I've had um, is is within data and making sense of, you know, a lot of like different disparate pieces of data and mm-hmm. being able to actually understand what's going on instead of just numbers on a screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when I was in management, I would take that with me everywhere. I would say, look, you know, uh, my artist maybe hasn't played there before, but they're getting a lot of site traffic from that, you know, right. from there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and those people are sticking around and they're consuming the music and that'll help that helps leverage kind of all these different pieces mm-hmm. into an act and paints a narrative of like what's actually going on yeah absolutely uh, what, what are some things in in marketing where people can i guess learn some skill sets are there any good resources that you like sending people or are there any good you know it's like a lot of free certifications out there some of them are legit some of them are not there's some for a small fee like the facebook certifications the google certifications like what would you recommend are some skill sets people can develop yeah that's a oh that's a good question so i think it depends you know i think the way um specific to the music industry what i see a lot of is um is a lot of people who are you know rightfully and understandably focused on um 
content, on branding, um, and really kind of the outward side of marketing, which I think is super important. You know, you can't mm -hmm. have a successful fest festival or successful venue without like a really strong brand. Sure. Um, where, where I differ a little bit and in my experience and where I really, you know, encourage people to look at is, um, is the flip side of things, which is really honing in on um, the data and analytics components. Um, it's, it's super important. So Google has a really good certification for mm -hmm. analytics. Um, so does, uh, I think HubSpot has a, a pretty decent one. Um, if you, uh, if you have LinkedIn premium, I think you have access to their entire library of uh, marketing courses. Uh, but I, I really recommend that because for the same reason I just mentioned, you know, it translates to no matter anything you do, um, mm -hmm. just be able to make sense of numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's that. Um, I've really focused on the digital end of, of things, uh, particularly like ad buying and how to structure a, uh, you know, if somebody says, Hey, you're in charge of this festival. Uh, here's a $1.2 million marketing budget. Like, what do you do with that? Right. right? <laughs> you know, where do you start? Uh, and, and really kind of focusing on, um, on how to lay that out in, in mm -hmm. a comprehensive strategy that really um, helps boost sales and helps kind of get the word out and everything like that. Um, so, and, and a lot of that is grounded in, uh, in, uh, digital strategies that are really, um, you know, I would say the the biggest kind of piece of insight that I think has had helped me, um, at least uh, back when I was doing a little bit more hands on. Like right now, I do a lot of um, larger strategy, uh, a lot of management uh, of like people and budgets and things like that. Um, but when I was getting my hands really dirty. Um, realizing that as a live event promoter, mm -hmm. um, it's it's really e-commerce. That's what we're doing, right? Um, you know, obviously the end product is different. You know, you go to a concert and you have the time of your life versus receiving a shirt in the mail. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual marketing to get there, right? Uh, somebody, you know, sees an ad, Here's from friends that you know this festival's super rad. They you know hear something on the radio maybe, or um, and then see something in the message boards, and then they're mm. like, "Whoa, I gotta go! I'm getting it from everywhere." Not right. realizing that it's all coordinated by one team and one person. Um, you know, all of that are like bags of tricks that e-commerce has developed over the course of uh, a really long time. So. Um, so one of the things that I was like I said, what I was doing like really like hands-on um, digital work is I would just look to like Amazon to Shopify, things like that. And I said, what are they doing? You know, right. they're, um, they're saying, Hey, you know what? Like we don't necessarily um, know how people are going to react to anything. So instead mm -hmm. of making assumptions, let's structure this as tests. Let's change, right. you know, the layout of this website or the color of this button or some of the copy or the verbiage on the page. Um, and see how people react. And if more people buy, then that's great. Let's do more right. of that. If less people buy, then let's stop doing that. So you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I think that was one realization that, um, uh, and particularly, you know, within, um, within the like the data components of e-commerce is so sophisticated in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, where you can tie back on a dollar level, um, like how many people in this zip code are, you know, how much portion, what portion of my revenue is coming from this zip code versus right. this zip code, right? Mm -hmm. And that informs your advertising decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you can get really, really granular. And a lot of these companies um, were doing that, but when, you know, when I uh, started doing a lot of, uh, festival work in, uh, in 2014, which is really when, um, uh, when I was going like whole hog into, into that side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, 
there was almost nobody like there was no almost nobody doing it right. at that level uh, and to this day i still see a lot of promoters who can just stand to benefit from from that level of granularity mm -hmm. i love that are there you mentioned hubspot and and the linkedin premium of courses um I've looked into HubSpot before, um, and then, you know they have like all these. Every course has a certification at the inbounding course. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, fr a free one. Is is that something like not that course specific, but is HubSpot something you recommend for people that are really into marketing to to go and uh, learn about different strategies about marketing? Or yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say um, there's it's a good question. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of free resources out there that are are fairly good. I mean, I, I read things like, um, like Moz, which is a, a website, like Moz, oh, oh. M -O -Z .com. Okay. Um, yeah, that talks about a lot of like, uh, a lot of uh, digital strategies and uh, particularly um, more um, like very high level stuff, you know, mm -hmm. about just particularly for beginners, they have a really good uh, like blog series of like SEO and ads for beginners and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say um, hubs. So the funny thing is, it's like uh, I th I think for for me, it's like you know, you ever like talk to a chef who like their favorite thing is like McDonald's hamburgers, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, I'm not gonna say that I'm you know I'm I'm at the level of a you know executive chef or anything like that, but I um. You know, me personally, I'm not certified, I think, in anything but like Google Analytics mm -hmm. uh, and, and Google AdWords. But I hear like the Facebook Blueprint course is really, really good, mm -hmm. um, particularly on the content marketing side. HubSpot has um, some really good um, uh, certification courses. Um, a couple of, yeah, I would say those three. Uh, Eventbrite actually has a event marketing course oh. that... Oh, yeah, uh, I could, I'll send it to you after this and you could like get, okay. um, but I recommend, you know, pretty much all of the people that I manage um, get that because it's, mm. it is, it is just like some very basic, like top line and really smart things to think about. So, cool. um, yeah. And then otherwise just kind of seeing, you know, a lot of the ideas that I get, uh, like I said, are pulled from either other industries entirely mm -hmm. um, or just seeing you know people that I respect and really enjoy and what they're doing you know I see you know c3 oh, yeah. structuring something through Lollapalooza being like oh, that's a great idea you mm -hmm. know and being like really inspiring kind of informing decisions mm -hmm. so are there any because when you go to like places like HubSpot or LinkedIn that has like almost what seems like endless amount of marketing courses are there any like topics that you would recommend they either mm -hmm. like learn first or even like if they're just doing their own search on, on YouTube, whatever, or any like specific topics that you think they should search and learn about? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the easiest and maybe sexiest thing to say is like to learn about um, brands and branding. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and again, like I said before, I do think that's important. It's, there's a, a, a really good book. It's uh you know, it's kind of a classic. It's called um, On Brand. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and there's another one that I think I have maybe back here. Oh, yeah. This the is a 22 million. Me, yeah. yeah. This is a really good book. Brand is a four letter word by Austin okay. McGee. I would recommend this. Um, and, and I think a lot of people start there just because um, that's, that's the outward facing stuff, you know, the content stuff, um, mm -hmm. you know, how to structure a good content plan, how to build a content calendar right. um, so that you're keeping up on your socials and everything that. Um, that all being said, I would really recommend uh, that people start on the digital front, especially somebody entering the industry, mm -hmm. because first of all, it gives them an edge right away. Um, right. There's, you know, there's less, um, you know, kind of on the advertising side, you break advertising or marketing, you know, you break advertising largely into two different like areas, right? You have, mm -hmm. you know, you have your creative side, which is the people like who come up with the actual stuff that you see, like the ads, the, right. um, you know, the copy, the, the verbiage, the copy, uh, whatever. And you have the strategy side. And the strategy mm -hmm. side is the teams that do the research. They say, okay, this is, you know, who we're targeting. 
this is who we want to speak to. This is who mm -hmm. we want to craft a meaningful message to. Mm -hmm. This is why we think they will buy. Uh, this is really our like hypothesis, for lack of a better word, of how we're going to approach these people. You know, it's um, they are millennials who love going to, um, you know, high quality food and wine like mm -hmm. events. And so that therefore, like we should be targeting this specific subset of the creative team would take that and say, okay, we're not gonna show like tacos and burgers. We're gonna show like mm -hmm. higher quality food. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's maybe like more of a lady, avocado toast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, or, or whatever. And, uh, and a lot toast. of, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. With uh, everything bagel seasoning, uh, <laughs> uh, which is the jam. Uh, but, Brussels sprouts. Oh, not, what is it? Uh, broccoli oh, sprouts. <laughs> broccoli sprouts. Love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm like the quintessential millennial. I, you know, I'm like, give me all that stuff. Um, but, but I think that I would really encourage, especially people. Uh, you know, a lot of my work sits on the strategy side, and that's where mm -hmm. I see a lot of places lacking where. It's not lack of ideas, you know, when, when I, um, you know, most of the time marketing is an exercise in saying no to yeah. other people's ideas and, <laughs> and stay the course because everything that you're doing is grounded in strategy. Right. Um, and so things like, you know, Hey, we should uh, do a flash mob or we should do, you know, like we should build like this giant PR studs thing, or like, mm -hmm. let's, let's have our own radio station or, you know, all of these are actually real examples from my past. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have the knowledge and, uh, and the skill to be able to say why, you know, right. like, why are we going to do that? To what end? Mm -hmm. um, if we're just spending 50, 60, $70,000, like what's the point of it? How many people are going to buy, buy tickets? How do we make right. our money back on it, et cetera. Um, and so that's where I would, I really see a lot of, um, a lot of need for for new people in the industry to really fit into mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the strategies just because the nature of things that we're dealing with usually um you know younger people uh younger mm -hmm. fans who go to our shows and everything uh, like it's a lot of it's grounded in digital strategy right mm -hmm. and so I, I would say definitely starting there uh you know i i got in, i have a decent background in like traditional advertising and, you know, billboards and radio and TV and all right. that stuff uh, as well. And that certainly helps me along, but the times that I use, you know, my like digital intuition and things that I've just learned and experienced in the past um, from, from that side and particularly from a strategic opponent is, you know, far outweighs that. Sure. So, sure. Um, so, so I'm going to put a pin in the, uh, the, the mm -hmm. stunts. I want to go back to that, but yeah. before I go to there, um, well, the space I'm in, right, for, I guess, now in the, in the music industry, being a podcaster and having, like, being a teacher and um, doing courses, a lot of these DIY um, music industry managers um, and marketers are falling into the space, you know, like, all those entrepreneurs that are on, that you see online that have a course, like, everyone has a course that they're trying to sell you and get, get you to, um, you know, trip, do the tripwire thing where you get a free ebook and then the free ebook gets you on an email list. And now you get mm -hmm. a bunch of emails and now they're trying to sell you a course. Um, so a lot of marketers in the music industry are starting to follow, and that's in, at least in the DIY space, are starting to follow that format. Um, I don't know how useful that is for, for events, but basically what they're focused on is the brand first, right? The brand and the content. And then they're really focused on like sales funnels and customer journeys, retargeting. Um, do you see any value of that when it comes to events? And what are your thoughts on that in, in general, th those kinds of things? Yeah. Uh, in general, I'm a fan. You know, I think all that stuff is, um, you know, it, people do it because it works. Yeah. Uh, and what you're talking about is like the, the foot in the door technique, right? Yeah, there, um, there's so... an artist, um, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. There's an artist named no, Corinne, Corinne Campbell. Um, if you look at her socials, I mean, barely any followers she barely even posts on like maybe branding can, can at least a little bit of work at least sure. content frequency on those free platforms but she calls it main street marketing and mm -hmm. she has way more people on her uh subs paid subscriber list than she has followers on instagram and she's making between 15 and eighteen thousand dollars a month um just from subscriptions and it's huge no label awesome. no management, all just being a marketing ninja yeah, I think that's that's a huge, huge, you know, when you're doing things like that, um, 
you know, especially on, on the business side of like the DIY space, um, you, it's about, you know, the reason that you brand yourself is to showcase that you're an authority on something, right? Um, and there's, there's a lot of uh, benefits once you're established as an authority on something, no matter how small or how niched it is. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of ways like you could then find people who will pay you right. for that, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, there's like one of the like one of the most probably like impactful books that I read last year um, was a thing called the Passion Economy. Uh, Passion it economy. was yeah. yeah, it's called it's by um, a economic journalist named Adam Davidson, and I'll. I'll spare you the details. It's a really great book, but um, his main like thesis throughout the book is that, you know, that the same way that the you know, sustenance farming turned into like industrial, you know, like mega corporations and things like mm-hmm. that, and everybody was like, "This is the end of the world," and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, some people did lose jobs, but also it created a lot more jobs, and it was just right. different. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people are freaking out about like the AI revolution as well, right? right? Um, sure. Because they're like, oh my God, all of a sudden, all these like, you know, all this globalization and AI and everything, um, they're going to be able to do all these like things mm-hmm. and where everybody's going to be out of jobs. And what, you know, what he was saying is, sure, maybe that's true, but it's not that people are going to be out of jobs. It's the jobs are going to be different. And yeah. what the and way that they're going all to... the time throughout history. Exactly right. It's, and it's really fascinating the way he breaks it down because he says, basically the, the, where we're heading right now is you can take advantage of, you know, globalization. You can take advantage of the fact that, you know, particularly this is absolutely excellent for musicians too, um, that they're, your audience is the entire world. Mm-hmm. And if you become an authority on something, no matter how niche it is, if you are the best at it, even if it's like this minuscule random thing, you know, even if, uh, you know, Mike Maurer is uh, one of, I'm not, but if one of the best (laughs) marketers for, um, you know, for independent concert promoters and festivals, right? Like Mm -hmm. very niched specific thing and particularly like uh marketing director right or whatever right. it is um you could just your entire audience is the world and you could do it you could reach those people very cheaply so all you have to do is just go and find people who are willing to pay you mm-hmm. for for that mm-hmm. and um and out out of like out of everybody in the world you could build a nice little career off that absolutely and, and, yeah and so i i just i I read that and it was like, you know, like it's it's not about, you know, being Amazon or Facebook or or anything. It's not about being, you know, uh, Kenny Chesney or right. <laughs> or whomever. Like if if you find there's, I can't remember who wrote it, but there's an old old blog post like decades a uh, decade and a half ago or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure. It's an old old UX guy. It was called a thousand true fans. Yep. Kevin Kelly. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 That's a great, yeah, so you know where it was going. All the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I'll explain the details of it real quickly, but you know, it's the idea is like, you know, if you have a thousand people pay you a hundred dollars each a year, that's, you know, then that's pretty 100, good. hundred grand. Yeah. 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 So like, um, I really, really like that idea. And I would say that like the the biggest thing is like is knowing what you're passionate about, knowing what you're good at, like what, mm-hmm. what you're just naturally good at. Um, and really like going like developing those skills on steroids so that no matter how like small or targeted or niche it is, or if you're an artist, no matter like how specific your genre is, mm-hmm. just being like freaking excellent at it and then going out and finding people because if you're excellent at something no matter how small it is somebody's going to pay you and that's the building blocks to to build having a business you know yeah absolutely i always say i say it was a few things so to, to that um because mm-hmm. when it comes to, like, so to the artists so let's say talking about the artists that are listening and the aspiring artist managers if 
you can find say 10 to 20 real fans, right. That are willing to share your music. They're not your parents. They're not your friends. Mm. They're not the people that are just trying to please appease you. Like, Oh, you, this, this song's so great. You did such a good job. Like the way you know, your song is good when people actually share it without even asking you, uh, that's, that's how you know it's good. Uh, heart, yeah. And if you find 10 to 20 real fans that are true fans, you can probably build a strategy to where you can find those thousand fans. And that's where I would love the subscription model because even let's say you have a hundred that are paying 10 bucks a month, that's a thousand dollars a month that um, is now coming in for as revenue. Right. And mm -hmm. if, um, and you don't have to like focus on the millions of fans or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of followers and streams, it takes much less. And even on Twitch now, I heard, what was it? I heard on a podcast literally this week, uh, it takes about 138 uh, subscribers on Twitch to where you can make 25 to 50 grand a year as a creator, which is crazy. Yeah. 138 people. I mean, it's so yeah. realistic. No, it's, that's great. I mean, I really like that. I mean, and even back when I was in, um, you know, when I was managing artists, um, you know, you take somebody like big Sam's funky nation, um, mm. which is, you know, how we met. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's, okay. uh, who's amazing and, and, and really super talented big Sam and, and like, um, you know, he was, a, he's able to build a pretty good career as a touring musician. Um, mm -hmm. not necessarily because he's, you know, he's playing arenas and stadiums or anything like that. You know, he's, he's playing clubs, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, smaller clubs, so like 300, 400, 500, 600 caps, somewhere around there. Um, uh, at least when I was working with him, but also like, your audience is the entire world. So, you know, yeah. a, a, a jazz festival in Germany would call and they'd pay like a ton of money for him to go over there, right? Yeah. And perform because it's a new, like it's, he's a you know, Grammy nominated New Orleans jazz musician. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, a, a um, like a ski lodge uh, up in, you know, wherever, like Tahoe or Utah or wherever they go skiing. Um, uh, like Park City, I think is, is, is a good example. Like they would pay a ton of money because they weren't trying to, you know, take money at the door and figure out, oh, this artist is worth, you know, uh, you know, $2,000, $3,000 in ticket sales. So I have to give right. them X minus that or whatever. They were like, I like the music. I'm really buying this. Like, this will be great. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pay the right amount of money. And like, you could build a really good career off that. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. I'm going to ask you a, one more marketing thing and then yeah, we'll change, we'll change pace a little bit. Um, actually, man, I have two burning questions, but let's, we'll see. Let's see, where it, see where the conversation goes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you mentioned, um, uh, I don't know, you call it, um, I forgot what you call it, like maybe creating moments or um, whatever. But so one of my favorite managers is, is Chef Gordon, and he always talks about creating moments, right? So what other people might call guerrilla marketing, and it sounds, it sounds like you've done a few stunts before. So I'd love to hear what you've done, but Every, every music business 101 class, uh, every semester, I start with a story. And every marketing lecture in my production management class, I start with the same story. But I always tell students, it's 1974. You're in London, one of America's biggest rock stars who sells out arenas. I know where you're going with this. All over the country <laughs> is is performing their first show in London and they only have a few hundred tickets sold for Wembley Arena. And then I tell them the story about, you know, having the billboard truck break down in Piccadilly Circus. Um, I don't know if you know that story, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but, but that's how I like to tell them like, you know, music marketing is all about creating moments of history or stunts. That's something that people will talk about. And it could be as elaborate as that or as simple as um, Wolfpack doing the, the Sleepify campaign, which is mm -hmm. so, so brilliant. Um, I don't know about know about that one, but that's how they funded their entire uh, album. Oh, and and when Spotify yeah. basically changed all their rules, that you no longer have silent tracks, and you can no longer have uh, you pick it paid differently on based on the length of the track. But but anyways, um, lots of fun stories there. But are there any like uh, favorite stunts or moments of history that um, you've seen or that even you've done yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think like you know, to me the. Um like a lot of the the moments are it's about to, to me it goes back to like to what end right uh, and mm -hmm. and you have to like the, the brilliant thing with chef gordon is he he had a complete you know throughput of it like he, he knew exactly where he wanted it to head mm -hmm. he knew exactly to what end it was going to be um and i i think that um 
you know, whether implicitly or explicitly, like he he had that like he knew what the follow through was, and it wasn't. The, the ending isn't creating, you know, a moment or a publicity stuff. That's the beginning. Right. And so, um, you know, with, the, I think, one of my favorite, like, Shep Gordon stories, um, which we used to talk about uh, mm. a, a lot uh, at Hukou produced, like, festivals, was um, was his paper panty story. You know that oh, one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you, 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 and, you want to tell it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, and I might get some of the details wrong, but like, but um, essentially, uh, Alice Cooper was coming. I think it was with schools out, um, mm -hmm. and um, he knew that he had to make a a really big splash. So what they really wanted to do was um, was have an album, you know, back when they actually had album covers and albums and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> that the album cover was a um, was a desk that you would pull up and uh inside like the the desk there was like little paper panties <laughs> um and and so he was like this is gonna be like fun and controversial it's really on brand for uh for alice cooper alice, absolutely <laughs> um but what he did was so he ordered um you know a bunch of album covers because they were expecting this to be a big hit uh, and so a ton of different shipments from, you know, from around the world. Um, but what he also did was he took uh, one shipment and he um, ordered a cheaper version of paper panties that were, um, I believe like they were like flammable or didn't have the same oh, yeah. um, like uh, fire, um, fire resistance that others would, knowing that it would be stopped at the border and rejected at the border. Mm. And he then tracked the shipment, arranged for press to come out when customs seized this giant shipment of paper panties <laughs> and started it's the, you know, the press was taking photos and he knew that that shipment was going to, you know, hit the headlines of, you know, Alice Cooper's paper panties seized at the border. <laughs> uh, and the record label like flipped out at the time, you know, they were like, oh, we're gonna have to throw all of these, you know, this this mega order of paper panties away. And he was like, no, that was just one shipment that I did for this publicity stunt. <laughs> um, the rest are totally safe and we're good to go. Right. And um, and it's, you know, that, that's brilliant, but it's also because he had like, he really had thought this through in a really significant way. And <laughs> he knew what like, he knew the outcome that he wanted and every and uh, he was able to get the application that he wanted. I think, um, you know, and, and I've done stuff, uh, you know, I've done some fun stuff, but like, I would say more often than not, you know, you don't really hear about the stories about the things that uh, that don't work. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and and so, um, like for um, uh, when I was at Hookah, we produced a, a festival called Pemberton Music Festival, mm -hmm. and um, and there. It was a big camping festival in Canada, um, up in Vancouver, just north of Vancouver. Uh, it has about like 50,000 people. I think it's third year was probably the second largest camping festival in, in all of Canada, something like that. Um, we had people like Pearl Jam, we had the, you know, Skrillex. We, it, was, it was a pretty substantial festival. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, um, you know, the, the CEO of Hookah really kind of was like, let's think about, let's take some money and create a publicity stunt, right? And do something. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the marketing team was like, like, look, we're trying to, honestly, like we're, we're trying to sell this thing out. Like we don't want to pull ourselves away because this, this thing naturally gets uh, attention. It's naturally viral because, mm -hmm. you know, Pearl Jam's playing and, right. you know, uh, Okay, like the killers are playing I have a poster mm -hmm. right here mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and whomever uh, and so all like we really have to hone in and focus on um, on, on selling tickets mm -hmm. and it was like no like don't worry about selling tickets let's you know let's just do something fun and creative mm -hmm. um, you know for, for better or for worse but I think you know the, the lesson was that we didn't really necessarily have the, the right strategy in place so what we did um, we came up with was to announce the um, the lineup, we 
one of the, the cool things uh, about Pemberton was that the main stage was set against kind of like a forest of trees and we had projectors that were, uh, the, it was through a company I believe called Trippy Trees that was projecting like these trippy like laser lights and like sketches of artists and things like that oh, cool. mm -hmm. um, against the trees. So while you were watching an artist, there was like all these very like trippy patterns and like, mm -hmm. you know, like that would form into like the outline of Missy Elliott or whomever. Oh, cool. um, yeah. So we, we decided to riff off that and, um, you know, um, uh, Rachel Puckett, who's you know, who was um, my my coworker and the other marketing director um, at Hookah, who's you know absolutely brilliant. Um, she came up with the idea of doing bringing up a bunch of lasers into different places in Vancouver mm -hmm. um, that would project you know really like mysterious things onto you know different buildings and mm -hmm. going into high density places like nightclubs and like projecting it on uh, the, the building outside a nightclub. And we, you know, we spent a lot of time and money and, uh, and everything planning it. And it would lead to a website called, oh, what do, what does the tree say or something? What do the trees say.com? Mm -hmm. This is a while ago. So I'm trying to remember, it might be fuzzy on the details. Um, and, uh, and then we would, you know, on that website, we would have a playlist that was playing like the artists that we would eventually, you know, that we would announce and everything. It was a really, really cool idea. Um, but we didn't necessarily have, um, you know, the, the amplification side in place. We didn't really necessarily um, understand the strategy or, or whatever. And it was really kind of done, you know, as, as a prompt to like, let's just do something fun. And like, ultimately I think we had, you know, maybe like, 500, 600 people on the website um, didn't like really lead to anything and it kind of like just um, just was there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd say that, that as a caution, you know, I think <laughs> yeah. publicity stunts are good if you're, you know, if you're really thinking about it holistically. Mm -hmm. um, but but that's not a strategy, you know. Um, right. Jeff Gordon's strategy was I need to sell albums. And the way I'm going to do that is by making Alice Cooper one of the most hated men in America right. and getting parents to talk about him. And right. so their children who are rebelling against him, their parents want to naturally like Alice Cooper. Exactly. Like yeah. That's that's the strategy. And then he was that he was working backwards from there. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? And that's where a lot of, you know, the the ideas that he had came from. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that, that's that's a good way to put it, having the, the, the strategy first and then developing the the different marketing ideas or the plan around the right. overall strategy yeah because yeah the right hatred, the hatred of parents was his strategy and um if you're was, whatever they could piss the parents off especially back in those days in the, in the 60s and 70s when everyone's way more conservative than they are t today absolutely yeah if you're an artist like um you know it's it's not about getting attention necessarily right it's about getting like what do you do after you have attention right right um and and so a lot of people miss that next step of mm -hmm. what do you do it doesn't necessarily you know you have you could have you can go viral on tiktok and it converts to no sales because right. it has nothing to do with you know your music or whatever exactly. um and, and so you really have to kind of think about it that way and um look at it from you know from a results perspective, you want to know what what is the final thing that you want? What is the step to get there? And how do we get there creatively? Yeah, so. that's, that's a really good way to put it, right? It kind of ties it all together. It's not the, fo the focus shouldn't be on, I want to have a million followers on Instagram. I want to have a million plays on YouTube. I want to go viral on TikTok. That, that shouldn't be the goal. Like that could be a, a strategy within the bigger picture, but that shouldn't be Absolutely. your sole and only strategy. Um, so I want to jump into kind of, and tie to marketing and together, but um, you, you, you are the marketing director for White Oaks Music Hall or White Oak Music Hall? Yeah, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm their marketing director. Okay, and um, you guys are doing shows right now and the venue's based in, in Houston, Texas. So I guess the first question I have, it's a it's a 1200 cap room, I think, right around there? No, so uh, White Oaks is a pretty unique space. Um, okay. Basically, um, there's it's, it's just uh, north of downtown Houston, really. Mm -hmm awesome location and um there's 
there's really three spaces that we okay. do shows on um, there. We have a smaller um, pre, this is pre-COVID numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a smaller 250 capacity uh, club room, kind of like um, the, the parish or something parish. like that. Yeah. Uh, um, and that's at that's, House of Blues in New Orleans for, for listeners. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Uh, then we have a, um, connected to it, we have a 1500 capacity, um, theater, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, that's for more like national acts, um, mm -hmm. and that's probably our busiest stage normally. Um, and then we have right outside, we have a 5,000 cap, uh, amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And so, awesome. um, yeah, we actually have like a hilltop and a slow, you know, it's a very, you know, most amphitheaters are, you know, 10, 15,000 capacity. Mm -hmm. um we have that same feel um but just of like an outdoor amphitheater we could still do big shows there um we you know in 2019 we did tame impala vampire weekends um nice. you know uh done flaming lips portugal the man a bunch of really really great artists there um but you it's it's a lot more like um it's a lot more intimate you know than than if you're just like in a, a mega amphitheater show mm -hmm. So a question that's what I like last marketing question and I want to kind of talk yeah, about yeah. The, sh the shows you guys are doing now and how you're doing the shows with, with, with the pandemic and everything. But um, for the 250 cap room, so most people that are listening, they're not going to go out and be doing shows in a 1500 cap or a 5000 uh, cap venue immediately. Um, mm -hmm. They're hopefully working their way up towards that. Right. But um, what I see a lot of people struggle with, not just artists and their managers, um, also like just promoters, like how do you promote a show in a, 250 to 400 cap room with a really tiny budget because those budgets are i don't know what your your budgets were in the past but you're talking about 500 hundred dollar budgets like how do mm -hmm. you spend that money and actually convert that to sales because that's what marketing is supposed to do like i always say um and it's not like the, the dump on advertisers but i would say there's there's market and it's like the easy way i break it down but there's marketers and there's advertisers marketers make money and advertisers spend money uh, <laughs> it's like don't be an I'll, I'll wag my finger at that but <laughs> uh but i know what you're trying to say for sure yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, can, you can just throw a bunch of money out there at, at ads and everything and not convert into sales so like how correct. how do you take a budget that small and actually get something out of it so this is um a really fundamental concept um that i've preached to almost everyone and it's the idea of a marketing mix um mm -hmm. and uh i'll explain what it is but do you know what it is okay. I, yes. i've heard the term I, okay but i don't know if i understand so, the term the same way as far as ticket sales go and this, this is to your point directly nobody sees an ad and goes buys a ticket right away that just doesn't happen um nobody he sees a post on Facebook and goes and buys tickets right away. That's not, uh, that's not the natural. When I say nobody, I mean, basically nobody. There's some oddballs out there. Right. Um, what happens, the way that, uh, the way that you sell a ticket is really there's, I mean, there's a couple of things that sell tickets. Yeah, you know, the biggest one is urgency, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the biggest idea behind selling a ticket of anything, period, Mm -hmm. is people may be interested in a show, right? And that's kind of stage one, um, mm -hmm. but they're not going to act on it. So I might be interested in going to see, you know, uh, Fish at Madison Square Garden. Bad example, because I'll always buy tickets to Fish, but still, <laughs> uh, I may be interested to go, but there's nothing compelling. That's, that's also not a 250 it. cap venue band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair, fair, fair. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, no, but, uh, you know, who, whomever it is, uh, I could be interested in seeing them. But you, the question you have to ask yourself is, what could I do to make somebody buy a ticket today, right now, rather than mm -hmm. tomorrow, right? Rather than a week from now. Um, and that's through urgency. That's why, you know, typically uh, promoters, you know, do things like we celebrate when things sell out because that places mm -hmm. urgency on other shows. That's why uh, at a festival you have tiered ticketing, right? Because right. you're saying, oh, here's your last chance to buy Two now. To yeah. Exactly. Um, but, you know, the, the kind of other things uh, are, going back to what I was saying, is, is the idea of a marketing mix. And that is... Um, Basically, the thing that will really stand out uh, as a fan in my head 
isn't if I see one ad and, and just ignore it and carry on my life. Right. It's I go ahead and I see a Facebook post and it doesn't register. And then I hear my friend talking about it and it mm -hmm. kind of registers. And then I see it posted on the artist website or an email or whatever. And then I'm like, oh man, like I'm seeing this mm -hmm. everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and people are generally very bad at, um, you know, at piecing that together, right? Like when you see things in a lot of different places, you, um, you assume that there's a lot of activity and like buzz about a show mm -hmm. um, without necessarily, like if I see, uh, a million ads about your podcast mm -hmm. I'll be like whatever he's running ads but if right. I see you know uh, 10,000 um, uh, impressions about your podcast and half of them are from friends that are talking about it and part of them are from ads and part of them are from Facebook posts and emails from you and everything like that then you're like wow like there's there's a groundswell there's a real like there's a lot of buzz here um, mm -hmm. and you don't need money to create that and so what I would say there is, um, as a promoter, what we do is we tap the resources that we have in lieu of a budget and just use the budgets to, you know, to help boost that final mile. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's different, I, I would tap different partners, right? So mm -hmm. media partners, uh, there's, you know, there's always media who's willing to get behind you and write about your show, um, big or small. Um, and by media, I mean, anybody I would consider influencers in that as well. Um, even people who don't necessarily talk about music. Just leading on who, people who have a voice, uh, other bands who might be, you know, who might support you. Um, and, you know, other than that, there's, um, you know, there's radio who, uh, who you could reach out to. Um, then there's, you know, kind of your own database, right? Your own, mm -hmm from the promoter side, your email list, your, uh, your Facebook and, uh, and social posts and Instagram mm -hmm. posts, uh, um, those things don't cost any money, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that you want to tap enough of those partners. Um, so, you know, if we have a show that's, that's really small and we want to, you know, we want to promote it because we think it'll, you know, it needs a, a, a full marketing mix. Mm -hmm. um, what we would do is we would hit up our street team, right? Who don't necessarily mm -hmm. cost any money. Um, we would hit up um, any kind of like, you know, we've had our friends at Live Nation send out email blasts on our behalf or mm -hmm. uh, other promoters uh, who just like, who are, want to help out because they know it'll come back to them later. Right. Um, and we'll do that. We'll hit up our, you know, media um, who we've spent a lot of time, you know, building relationships with and just say like, Hey, we don't have money to spend on an ad here, but can you throw us a bone or can we do a ticket giveaway or, mm -hmm. you know, leverage something. Um, and then we would take, you know, a small budget as well and run ads, but those ads are really just that final mile. It's saying right. like those ads aren't trying to generate interest because, you know, $150, $200 are going to do generate much interest mm -hmm. for you. Ultimately yeah. what they're trying to do is if, identify people who are already interested they're called remarketing ads so like right. if you're already interested in buying a ticket and you just haven't yet mm -hmm. that's when you you run ads and you say hey only seven days left that's where like the urgency comes in you know yeah, yeah. get your friends um buy tickets now and and so that way your money is only going to people who are most likely to buy tickets anyway and mm -hmm. you're really just staking your bet on your budget pushing them over the edge. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I mean, there's, you know, like I said, like you kind of have to, and I think this is where a lot of the, um, you know, this this separates a lot of the marketing from the promotion piece, right? When, mm -hmm. when, you've, when you kind of think about being a promoter, you think about what are all the creative things that I can leverage? What are all these little levers that I can pull? Mm -hmm. um, we just, uh, at White Oak, we uh, we're doing like a spring market because we have the outdoor space. We can make it oh, COVID fine. safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's super fun. It's something to do, um, you know, on uh, on our lawn. And we also um, on that property we have um, a separate business called Raven Tower that we also own. That um, is a bar that has a large outdoor space too. So we're able to oh, utilize okay. that in our parking lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and really like everything to have like 60 or so vendors out there. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't really want to spend a lot of money to get vendors. So like 
what's been working really well for us uh, just, you know, just today is we found all of the other markets that don't have, you know, um, anything going on the competing days. And we're like, hey, can you just like hit up your vendors and say like, you know, this market's happening and right. they are happy to do it because it helps their vendors, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of things that you could do. Um, I would think about um, really uh, that concept of a market means how do you start layering things on um, mm -hmm. so that so that people who are naturally interested are mm -hmm. seeing it from different places. Um, right. And I think that's, you know, separately, I know this is, we're talking about small budgets, but like separately, that's really a large reason why, you know, billboards and things like that really work is because you've already, right. it predisposes you a little bit to be more receptive. Mm -hmm. It's that, that's the term marketing mix. I haven't, I guess I've heard a term, but I use a, a different term because of a book I read. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there's guerrilla marketing, right? Which is the, the stunts and everything, whatever. But there's this marketer, a uh, legendary marketer, but uh, Jay Conrad Levinson, he has a book called guerrilla marketing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily focused on the, the stunt aspects. The way he describes it is, uh, and he and in, he's a former veteran, and he describes everything the, the warfare, and that's probably why he called the book guerrilla marketing. He has like military uh, lettering and everything, uh, military colors. Funny. But um, he calls it having a marketing arsenal, right? And you should have as many weapons in your arsenal as possible. And it's kind of the exact same thing. So marketing mix. I need to start using that word instead of your, your marketing arsenal. But it's having as many weapons at your disposal as possible, and it's just going out throughout a campaign. And you know, like social media posts as a weapon, having a flyer at a um, coffee shop is a weapon, having a poster up at the record store, that's a weapon. And the more they see it, having those those uh, impressions and then those touch points, um, that's when you get Absolutely. people interested. So I think that's 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 exactly right. I think, you know, uh, you know, any any marketer uh, for venues or festivals has like sat with a talent buyer who's like, can we do X, Y, and Z and all this? And you're like kind of rolling your eyes. But like the, the, the thing is they actually have a really good promotion. A lot of them have, you know, promotional intuition in the sense of like, that's a lot of the idea isn't, you know, maybe they don't have the strategic components or like there's some dumb ideas in there. Um, but without spending money, like you think about what are all these levers that you can pull? Um, and then you kind of break it out. You say, what are the most effective ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to pull those first. Right. right? I'm going to pull like the most effective thing is is saying, "Hey, this show is on sale," and putting it up on your website and sending an email. Right. Like right. that's a gimme. Everybody right. should be doing that. Yep, right? Absolutely. Uh, what's the next lever I could pull? Well, I could reach out to the artist and uh, coordinate with them about you know what they're going to say, give them assets, uh, mm -hmm. etc. What's the next lever I could pull? I could layer in. Uh, ad campaigns for the final seven days of the show, even though it's not a big budget, uh, I can start reaching out to. And so that way, if ticket sales are flying off the shelves, great. You've only pulled a couple of levers. Everything's great. You move on to the next show mm -hmm. and you know you stay sane um, and you avoid any kind of fire drills. But then this is kind of where the data piece comes back. If you start noticing that uh, things are faltering, if there's low traffic on the website, or if there's high traffic, but things aren't translating to ticket sales, right? You start thinking about like, huh, all right, like what is another thing that I could pull to make sure that 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 tickets keep getting sold? Mm -hmm, yeah, and and I love the idea, and it's, it's something that a venue can do really well, right? I love the idea of the the market that you guys have. Um, mm -hmm. There's a venue called St. Augustine Amphitheater in in Florida. It's a beautiful venue. I love that place and. Their former uh, GM, he's now the, I don't know if GM is the right title, but he, he's now running Huntsville Amphitheater, the one at the building right now. Um, but he's, is that the one uh, that's uh, in Fort Lauderdale? St. Uh, Saint, no, St. Augustine is in St. Augustine. Oh, yeah, I guess that would yeah. make sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. But um, Florida has a lot of different weird places. But um, <laughs> he says for, you know, for a venue, it's really important to get the community involved, right? Because you're part of the community. You want the community to support you. So you got to yeah. show love back to the community and having these markets and doing things for the community. Not only are you getting the community involved and excited about your venue, but now when you need to pull extra levers, if there's a show that is maybe selling well, now you have so many more resources at your disposal um and when it comes to maybe the diy artist or a manager um i mean us old school town buyers that used to literally walk around the streets and 
sell tickets by hand and then pass out flyers and put up posters at the same time. <laughs> I mean, no, mm-hmm. they may not know a thing or two, <laughs> but by doing those things, you're no, also absolutely. talking to people all the time, one-on-one, right? So it's not about 100%. trying to, the goal is, of course, the end goal is to try to sell them the ticket, but the main goal is to build a relationship. So now when you are walking through venues and bars downtown, when you can do that again, wherever people are now, mm. but um that's how you build relationships with people. Like I did, there's this guy in Orlando he, and I need to get him on the podcast. He does this so well. Uh, Swamberg is his name. And he's part of this group called Soliloquist of Sound. And he, when I, when I started out and that's who I like learned from, he was downtown every single day. He was always had a backpack with tickets, t-shirts, uh, whatever, vinyl. And he's always, you know, building the relationship, talking to people, getting to know them. And then before you like leave, like, Hey, yo, I have a vinyl or a shirt. Like he'd always try to hustle stuff. And he would literally make hundreds of dollars a day, just selling merch out of a backpack. But all, but he was very genuine at building relationships and having Love real it. conversations with people. And it's just, just it's like, a- nobody's too good to change the marquee, right? Like yeah. um, it's, I, you know, I, I work mostly remotely now. Um, but, you know, for some local festivals that I work with, I still do this. Um, but when I worked out of an office, like at, at Hookah, for instance, um, we would always have like flyers at the door. And no matter like, you know, if you were in the venue division or the festival division, or if you were a marketer or, or talent buyer or whomever, just grab a bunch of flyers yeah. and, you know, go home and just hit up your neighborhood because like, yeah. We're all street team, ultimately. <laughs> you know, we're all promoters, right? Absolutely, like yeah. we're we're all trying to make this thing work. We're all trying to sell tickets, um, and and I think that that's so important. And to the community aspect, I think it's it's absolutely true. The guys who um, who own White Oak Music Hall and, and the managing partners, um, you know, they've been in the music industry for for a long time through uh, an old Houston place called Fitzgeralds and um, through a festival called Free Press Summerfest and a couple others, and you know, they're they're so um agnostic and friendly and they're like they know um they know all of the other venues and they're like happy to help out other venues and Mm -hmm. and, you know a lot of that's you know i don't i didn't i inherited a lot of those relationships Mm -hmm. um but it's that same like sentiment it's like we're we're all kind of in this together obviously we're not gonna like ask somebody to promote a show when they have something else that same night sure um but you know we had um at White Oak uh, in in December, uh, this may be a good segue. We had the guys from um, from Shine Down. Um, mm-hmm. I can't remember their names um, right now, but the yeah you know, the show was selling well, um, and it was it was gonna get to you know get close to sold out, but we wanted to give it some extra love. And you know the problem that we were having, um, if you kind of just like looked at the stats, was um, a lot of that's like that I don't know what you would call it like alt rock have like heavier rock stuff but like mm-hmm. radio rock yeah. um like a lot of that those people lived you know outside the loop in the suburbs uh, of Houston like in places that we didn't have a natural reach for our audience just because we didn't do a type a lot of that music a lot of what we do is like indie rock um you know like rock country uh, metal, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. Um, and so we, we ended up reaching out to Ashley Montgomery, who runs the marketing for a venue called Warehouse Live, who does a lot of those shows. And she's, you know, she's a buddy and she was able to get the word out through Warehouse Live because they weren't doing anything at the time. Right. And she was like, yeah, dude, I'm so happy to help you guys out. Mm-hmm. Um, and we would do the same thing for her. So, right. So, I, I agree. I think the community aspect is is super important. Yeah, and I love the that fact that you guys were able to have a relationship with a competing venue because like most nights you're probably competitors, right? And it's yeah, who cares? We're trying to sell yeah. a ticket. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's such a healthy, I think, mindset for the community as an overall. Like, there's I won't I won't mention their name, but there's a venue in Orlando that that will not play nice with other promoters. And mm-hmm. you know, after I left the Plaza, that that venue actually reached out to me about doing shows there, and I was like. When I was at the plaza, you never ever responded to any of my messages. And they're like, Yeah, because you were a competitor. I don't talk to competitors. And I feel like that's the wrong mindset because another person, I will say his name because it's a good thing, uh, Ethan Levinson. <laughs> I don't know if you know him from, from AEG. Um, There's one time I really wanted to buy, buy a show for the plaza and we were competing with this actually same promoter and we lost the show. And 
I was so upset. And he said, it's, it's okay, dude. Like you're, there's plenty of other shows and the show is still coming to the market because there's so many different places in Florida that show could have gone to, but it's still coming to Orlando. So at the end of the day, it's still going to help the Orlando music scene, which uh -huh. in turn is going to help your venue when you book another similar artist. Um, and I never looked at things like that before that. And I was like, wow, that's such a good lesson. And it's why it makes it worthwhile to play nice with other venues. And we had that with a venue in Orlando where we did help help each other out. Uh, so I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the, the, you know, the barometer, like most like promoters start their businesses, not because they want to build like a killer high profits business, it's because they want to do cool shit and like right. and cool shit in their community, you know, yeah. and, um, and that's like a lot of that ends up uh, getting like perverted as the business mindset and everything takes on, uh, over and you know some of that is justified you know, obviously you have a business to run and everything like that but like ultimately at the end of the day if it isn't hurting your business um then then it only helps to play nice with people like it mm -hmm. it's it's something i very truly believe in like i think um yeah i i i keep that very close to the chest where like you know all of the people that I talk to, even, you know, outside of White Oak Music Hall or anything like that, um, I really try to be like, you know, attentive and good and, mm -hmm. and do, do the right thing for those people. Cause you never know when you're going to have to, uh, you know, ask for, for help or whatever. So. Yeah. And, and competition also grows the, the market size. Like something I've learned once is the, the best place to put a venue, right? So you're to open a venue or open whatever kind of business it, uh, it is the best place to put that business is right next to your competitor. Um, the closer you are to comp your competitor, the better yeah. it is because you're, you're not- it's like game theory. Yeah, exactly. Like you're <laughs> market in that area. And now that area yeah. becomes a hub for for that, whatever that business is. So if it's for music venues, there's two music venues next to each other on the same street. Now that yeah. becomes a hub to go for music. I mean, no like, uh, spots. <laughs> I always laugh about it. There's um, uh, downtown just off, uh, just off Bourbon Street. There's um, this is, is the most bizarre thing ever. There's two uh, there's two tiki bars like mm -hmm. within like a block of each other, and so oh, like yeah. me and my wife like jokingly call it the tiki district of New Orleans. The tiki district. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but yeah, like I mean, I don't ever really want to get a tiki drink, but when I do, I'm going to the tiki district. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, so speaking of White White Oak Music Hall. Uh, you guys are doing shows. Yeah. You're you're in Texas. Yeah. You're allowed to do shows in Texas. Uh, many many states aren't doing any shows yet. Like what? Tell me about the whole process. Like, are you guys doing it at a certain capacity? What kind of safety guidelines are there? And then for those of you that are listening way in the future, um, we're dealing with COVID. <laughs> we're, we're still a year. <laughs> the world a year is ending. Yeah. <laughs> if, if if this podcast is still available anywhere no, um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we're dealing with COVID and uh, you know lots of places in the United States in 2021 as of January or February 2020 as, as of recording are still locked down and a lot of places can't do shows a lot of places are operating at partial capacity so I guess tell tell everyone about what you guys are doing at uh, White Oak Music Hall yeah uh, no for sure um, so like you know March came along last March and everything shut down um you know we we were and in many cases still are running on a skeleton staff um mm -hmm. you know i had to furlough a couple of people from my team um others yeah it, re it really sucks um and you know there were some glimmers of, of like you know we put together a gofundme campaign um that popped off and we raised like like seventy thousand dollars that nice. just went directly to our staff the venue management took none of it um uh, particularly the furloughed staff and everything the and so like almost immediately we started to think about like look we have um 35 000 square feet of like usable space outdoors mm -hmm. that for for our amphitheater stage which is actually larger than that um it's you know it's 35 000 square feet not including restrooms of the stage and mm -hmm. all of that um and we are centrally located um we really kind of have a unique circumstance here and we have great relationships with artists just through promoting you know white oak's been around for um for about like three or almost i think four years now um and but but before that you know the guys that run it have been in the industry forever um and and so we really kind of started thinking about like like 
what can we do? You know, we thought about uh, drive-in shows. Uh, we thought about all, all different things. But we, as kind of COVID went on, we started to form this concept and we called it the Grid Concert Series. Um, this was before a lot of like the pod style shows were coming out and everything. Um, but it was really grounded in the fact that, um, and I'm getting a notification that my internet's unstable. So let me know if I cut out, but. It, it cut off for um, a second, what came right back but, in. Okay, great. So I was gonna say the, it was really grounded in the fact that like, we have all this space, we can, we have an outdoor stage um, if we basically start doing shows in this socially distanced way, mm -hmm. uh, what does it look like, right? And can we can we can we do it safely, right? Uh, but that was that was really like the, the impetus of it. So we started to think about the idea, um, and right around um, August, we um, we really started honing in, we kind of dabbled with the idea we announced um, back in July of Robert O'Keefe show, um, but then things got really bad with COVID and it didn't feel right to do it. So, um, mm -hmm. so we postponed it. Um, around, around August, uh, what we started doing was working with um, the mayor's office of uh, special events and uh, the permitting office to say, look, like we have a lot of space. We have, it's outdoors now like what are the protocols that we need to put in place mm -hmm. to safely and responsibly have a show um and so we actually ended up submitting i think like a 30 or so page um uh application to them which outlined a ton of safety protocols so the way that we we really do shows um first thing is that we are normally 5000 ish capacity um and we limited that to under 20% um, mm. immediately. So it's less than 800 people there. Um, all those people, and that's max, um, all those people are basically in pods, what we call grids, because it's the grid concert series. Mm. Um, they're, so they're in grids of up to six people. And so they have their own seven by seven space. We use, um, you know, we use risers or platforms on, on kind of the hilltop on the slope. Okay. Um, and then otherwise we kind of used bike rack along the bottom. We dolled them up, you know, we put uh, cool up lighting on there and, uh, and uh, Generations AV uh, did a really great job just like making it super vibey. Mm -hmm. um, but where we ultimately came out was we had just under 150 of, of these grids that we okay. could sell through of up to six people. Okay. Um, we also had a couple of, um, of larger ones. We have like cabanas and things like that that are up to 10 people. Um, so we're like, cool, each of these are socially distanced away from each other. Everybody has to go to the show and stay with their crew uh, in their grid, they're outdoors. Um, we're ma we mandate masks unless they're actively drinking. Um, everybody gets a temperature check and a screening before entering um, and just make sure that they're not uh, basically showing obvious symptoms. We have isolation zones, a lot of these best practices um, which you know compounded with the fact that it's outdoors compounded with the fact that it's um socially distant and people are masked um and you're really just you know you're only interacting with your own crew there's no bar lines because we are um we printed out these almost like sushi cards like these checklists mm -hmm. where you would order and either hand it off to a wait staff we also have an app that you could order through and they would just oh, bring cool. you drinks directly um we limited uh, the restrooms to every other stall. Um, and we also have like an attendant there to try to limit any lines and things like mm -hmm. that. We had uh, hand sanitizers uh, push, put around the, the place. All of our staff, um, you know, all of our staff really uh, had to be, has to be screened to make sure that's uh, temperature checked, wear masks, uh, every day that too. So we started putting all of these different systems in place, um, you know, to the point where we were discussing uh, look, if something happens at the, at the show and we have to evacuate site, the site, how do we do that in a socially distanced way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like even yeah. things like that, we really tried to, because we knew that um, there was going to be a lot of attention on us, right? There's not, sure. we were, you know, we well, were and are probably one of the only you know, places in, in Texas that are still doing live music. Mm -hmm. um, 
so once we kind of got that in place and, and really kind of honed in on, uh, we feel like we can provide a really safe environment for people, um, mm -hmm. given all the safety, uh, everything that we have in, in check. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what can we do to actually pull artists in? So we had, um, we started off with Major Laser, who was doing a drive-in tour um, across the country. Mm -hmm. And so they, um, this was like their only like non-drive-in show. They actually, you know, we did, uh, I believe, two shows with them uh, that both sold out. We uh, took uh, Shaky Graves, who lives in Austin, and brought him over to Houston, gave him you know, a place for the night to do an acoustic show. We had a lot of Texas country guys. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we had this uh, comedian, Bill Burr, do mm -hmm. four nights. Um, awesome. Yeah, and he was touring through. So we started really like tapping a lot of these relationships that we've built up over, uh, over the course. And even if artists weren't necessarily touring, um, like, you know, uh, like Co Wetzel or like all these guys who live in Texas and, mm -hmm. and want to perform, we were, we were saying like, hey, like we have this new concept. We feel really good that we could provide a super safe ex uh, experience given, you know, um, given all the safety checks that we, that we put into place. Um, we know people are hungry for shows. And so like we're doing, you know, we even got to the level of like no meet and greets, obviously, cause right. you know, things like that. Um, and so we put that all together, it kind of clicked um, and, the we did we did a 13 show run at the end of last year um and basically all of them sold out um and there awesome. wasn't a cheap ticket because it was a pot of six um you know our ticket scaling was everything from you know 200 dollars per grid up to thousands you know we're talking shows right now um that could go all the way up to like you know five thousand wow. dollars for four of these so there wasn't cheap you know and they have to buy the whole grid. They have to buy all six tickets. Yeah, basically what you have to do, um, so you can go with one person or you can go with six. You buy the grid and um, however many people you bring is how many ever, you know, however many people you bring. Gotcha. Um, so the price, you actually buy just that plot of land and that's socially distant from everything else. Um, and so what happened, I mean, like the, you know, we were kind of nervous about a lot of different things, right? right? Like, it was <laughs> yeah. like, oh, could we get artists? Could we get, um, you know, the city to approve it? Uh, could we execute operationally? Will Are people, people even up? gonna, will yeah. people show up? Um, and all those things really aligned. I mean, I think ultimately from a marketing end, you know, I think our average order price was $350 um, for, a, a lot of, for a lot of these shows, which means that people, and it was selling out, so people were like, happy to pay it uh we got a really great response from fans from artists from staff um we were able to get you know really good deals from the artists because they wanted to play mm -hmm. um and that's you know it, it really just kind of clicked um and so we we you know we shut down things for the holidays and because you know the weather is kind of like temperamental right now in houston mm -hmm. outdoors mm -hmm. um but you know, we're, we're ramping back up. We're looking at it um, starting in March again with, uh, with a handful of shows and then in April. And like, as we kind of get out of this COVID hellhole, um, <laughs> you know, we're just really feeling really confident that we have like this model that's, that really fires in all cylinders, you know, that the marketing feels comfortable about. I know I can sell these shows out um, and not spend an arm and a leg. Um, that operations feel as comfortable about because it's just a it's it's a responsible and safe environments that like are um, are the artists and the talent buyers and everything feel good structuring deals around. So it's not really like a long term solution for us. Um, sure. Like it's not like we're gonna be doing these forever. But like the the it keeps people where, working. Where it keeps people working, and where it kind of landed was like, look, maybe like these these shows aren't for everyone. It's not a twenty dollar GA ticket. Right. But it's kind of like a VIP experience for every single person that goes there. And people are really responding to that and really appreciating that. And so like, that's been just super awesome. And like, has, has just been a, a really, really great, like, part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of doing things for, for the community, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the community that are thankful for, for live music and they really appreciate you guys, right? So they're going to remember that when things open back up. But the other side of that is things also very 
politically charged, was there any kind of backlash? Because, you know, some people that are, are doing events are, are getting a lot of um, backlash for it and cancel culture is at an all time high. Like, was there any <laughs> kind of backlash for you guys doing shows? No, and I think this is where, um, you know, some of the, the communication side comes into play, right? Because it's not all just operational to your point. Um, it's also optics. Um, and within that, you know, the strategy that we took right from the get go was we're going to over communicate um, and we're going to be very, very transparent and very upfront about everything. We're not going to try to hide anything um, to the point where, you know, like we had um, on some of the shows, we had a hundred fifty dollar bar minimum on top of the ticket um, charge. Yeah. Um, and we were like, before somebody bought a ticket, we had like them check a box that's like, hey, I understand that this is, you know, so we were like, look, this is a different experience. We, you know, we, this is what we have to do to make it work, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we decided really early on from like a comms perspective to, um, to really lay everything out. So if you go on our websites, first of all, there's a safety section that kind of has um, uh, a couple of like, the top is really simple to understand. Like we have little icons about, you know, you have to wear masks and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But below there is a specific list of every single little thing that we're doing to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. um, and linked from there is a PDF document that talks about, you know, what is the venue doing? What are we doing with our staff? What, like you can go down the rabbit hole if you want on our website. Then um, that's all about safety information. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that, um, within uh, the actual grid, we have a subsection of our website just for the grid concert series where we have graphics that show exactly what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a, a really, really great graphic designer, um, Mark Williamson, uh, who goes by Mopsleet, um, who, who does all the graphics for the venue. And he put together, you know, a lot of like really great like illustrations of what it looked like before we had the show. And now we have a gallery and we have a video of the actual experience at the show because we you know, had a couple drones out there and we, we had a film oh, cool. crew. Um, and so we really, and on that page, we go back into all the safety information. Um, when you're buying a ticket, you acknowledge and see all of the safety information we linked to the page. Um, before you go to the venue, you get emailed all of our policies and, and, and protocols and everything. Yeah. Um, and so that, that was on the fan end. Um, and, and when we posted, even if you go right now, stickied uh, to our Facebook page, the top post and um, our Instagram stories, is graphics of all of our safety um information in a fun way like we're doing we're not just like this is boring and dull we have like <laughs> a little uh alien and spaceman talking to each other saying like you know keep your space uh you know things <laughs> uh, like that okay. yeah um, play on that <laughs> yeah um and so um and so we really wanted to over communicate that the next level of that was um was the press right and mm -hmm. So we made ourselves super available when we rolled this out. Um, we issued a press release um, and reached out to all of my contacts um, and all of the local you know, stations, all the newspapers, uh, all the radio, and said like, "Here's exactly what we're doing. You know, here's images of of it all. Here's how we're doing it. We're gonna field. You know, we probably did uh, between me and Luis, the GM." Um, and Johnny, one of the managing partners, we probably, you know, did 25, 30, I don't know, interviews. Ooh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, it, it was, celebrity. <laughs> it was, well, a lot of people were curious, but, you know, the thing to realize is that, um, you know, they, there is no, um, there is no narrative against small businesses trying to, you know, to make it work. Right, mm -hmm. that's that's not what the press is about. They're not trying to like kill businesses or anything like that. What they are about is trying to call out anybody doing it irresponsibly. Right. And and so we, you know, we were like, look, this is what we're doing. Here's all of the ways that we're doing this. We have the blessing from from the mayor's office. Um, we have artists buying in. You know, from the start, we only we said like the only way that we're going to do shows again is if we feel we can deliver a safe experience for artists like our staff. And, fans and all those three, three things aligned and we just laid them bare um and, and just made ourselves available and so um, basically um we cut it off at the head right there because there was 
there was nothing to dissect. It was all there. And, um, and so we got a really positive reaction. That's awesome. Um, I know we're about to run out of time and I actually have a meeting too, but let me ask one more question. Then I'll see how many of my little rapid fire ones that I can get in. But um, the, the guidelines that you guys are using, where do those come from? Is that something you guys arranged with the, the city and the, from state level, or is it coming from the sure. CDC? Like where does these guidelines come from? Uh, it's a little bit of everything. Um, okay. So we we pulled some stuff. Neva um, National Independent Venue Association had a really um, great reopening um, reopening guidelines uh, that they put together. The Event Safety Alliance put together um, reopening mm -hmm. procedures mm -hmm. that we borrowed a lot from. Um, we we definitely um, like we we definitely worked with the city on, on a lot of like the the concepts of like, you know, what's the capacity, you know, how, how are we going to do this? And, and really like, it was kind of barred from a couple of different places. You know, we also looked at best practices from the CDC, um, uh, county guidelines, like the mask wear, enforcing mask wearing, um, all that stuff. So we pulled a bunch of those resources together and just we're, we're really looking at like, there was so much information out there. If we take the really kind of the things that are the, the highest authority, you know, the CDC, the Event Safety Alliance, which was a coalition of doctors and mm -hmm. promoters and everything like that. Um, you know, the, the mayor's office, if we, if we combine all that, like, can we put together a comprehensive plan, plan that we can actually pull off? I like that. And yeah, I'll, I'll share the uh, Event Safety Alliance a PDF in the show notes. I have that. And it's really very, very detailed and really, really well, um, well done how they like researched everything and the pan the, the group that put it together is uh really i know a lot of those people a lot of uh smart intelligent people on um, when it comes to safety, sure. safety for events but um when, when the cdc or oh, they have already said this um when they started enforcing this two mask thing you guys got to push back <laughs> it's like a little political rant <laughs> uh, no i won't i won't go there no i'll say <laughs> Just kidding. look i think uh i read a really compelling study yesterday um on it that on the two mask thing that, yeah, that shows that efficacy goes from 48% uh, as far as like separating particles to when you're wearing two masks the proper way to like 90 something percent. Uh, I didn't really go down the rabbit hole too much, so I'm not going to comment on it, but uh, <laughs> I did read the headline in the first paragraph and I said, wow, that's that's interesting. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to chat about this offline, but <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll bring you some, uh, <laughs> some opposing articles. I mean, it might, it might help the particles, but what's happening to your heart and lungs. I always tell people, do your own research. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> a, a couple of quick little, little fun rapid fire ones. What was the first concert you've ever been to or your first memorable concert? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, okay, uh, first concerts, I think, uh, I, I grew up in Connecticut. I think okay. maybe rock cappella, like the Carmen San Diego acapella group <laughs> at like a, a free, uh, at a free show uh, at the like the local college, I think. Uh, I don't know, but I also like, you know, I started going to concerts uh, regularly, but I, I grew up in a town called West Hartford um, and Hartford, which was the next town over, um, had a, a really popular um, venue called the Webster Theater, which I ended up working at um, as my first gig out of the industry. Um, but, you know, I remember going to see like, so, the, so many bands there, cause it was, you know, a short taxi ride before Ubers uh, from my house. So, you know, Bad Religion and The Slip and um, Robbie Krieger and all sorts of people. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, when do you think of the word successful? Who's the first person that comes to mind? You, Chris. And, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, ooh, that's what, a good, what's the uh, opposite of successful? That's <laughs> what we should associate. With <laughs> <you>. <laughs> uh, man, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I really didn't, I, sh I should have uh, prepared for these rapid fire questions better because I actually don't, I don't I, know. I have, I have a list of 20 of them. I just pick them at random. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think about like people who've like kind of like carved out a, you know, a nice little niche for themselves and it's going back to like way back, like are considered authorities. Like I think, um, yeah, Dan Merker, who, um, who's a talent buyer, uh, you know, he's like in and out of projects all the time and all that stuff. But like, as far as like talent buyers, like 
he's one of the best guys I know. Like I would get mm. totally successful. And so like, I just think about people who have like, um, you know, regardless of what they're doing now, um, you know, uh, Addy Olson from um, who was at AEG and, um, and Live Nation uh, worked for C3 um, up until the pandemic and everything. Um, this is just like an absolutely like brilliant person and like success is almost like uh like intrinsic to those people you know like they're going to do be successful no matter what they're doing now or what they've done previously and so like mm-hmm. that's kind of like what i think about love it that, that, that would be a fun one to get on the podcast um what, what are the, the the books documentaries or podcasts you don't have to be it doesn't have to be all three but uh you can but books documentaries or podcasts you share the most uh, okay, so let's think about that. So I would say um, the just because I've kind of in the middle of of a couple of them. Um, so there's one that you know about called the Happiness Hypothesis, um, mm-hmm. which uh, is a, a phenomenal book that was totally unexpected um, to me. That you know I just kind of picked up on Audible because I think it was free, and it really just rang deep. And it really goes into like. Um, what is, you know, what is happiness? Like how do, um, how do you affect your own happiness? But not necessarily just the spiritual ones, you know, it really looks at the full side of the coin, you know, a lot of, you know, the, 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 bio, the bio, biological side of like happiness, a lot of people are predisposed to being, you know, happy or unhappy. And then also like really starts breaking it down of like, you know, what, what is like, what is what they call like the happiness formula, you know, like, um, why is empathy and, and reciprocity and like giving more than you get? Um, mm-hmm. And like, why does that actually make you happy? Like in a biological sense, what goes on in your brain? Why, why is it that if you're passionate about like the journey and not the destination, right? right that's, that's makes you happy. And I, like, I, I would put it, I put it a lot in the context of like what I do, where it's like, you know, regardless of, uh, of what I'm working on any single day, like ultimately like, I, you know, I very much, I enjoy it. Like, I love it all. And mm-hmm. I really like, that's what drives me both like professionally and like personally. So that's definitely one um, the passion economy, which I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. um, is another book that I would recommend um, on the marketing side um, made to stick uh, by stick. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's Dan and Chip Heath, I believe um, it is about how you create a, um, memorable moments Mm -hmm. and how like uh how you really create um uh something that has an impact like that really sticks with you right um uh that's that's a fantastic book um and then uh i think you know as far as podcasts go um you know i'm kind of uh, i'm a dork i i like there's probably the same ones you do tim ferris and oh, yeah. <laughs> joe rogan yep. those ones i, I love because i walk my dog every day and i just put it on and yeah. just listen to smart people be smart <laughs> where, where do you listen to podcasts do you use spotify or apple podcasts uh i use spotify, spotify? yeah just okay. it's, it's easy yeah it's it's so weird for me now because like for podcasts i listen to apple Podcasts, and now like rogan being on spotify i'm like ah i keep missing his episodes <laughs> i need to switch <laughs> <laughs> but anyway yeah. um this, this was fun uh before i ask you the last question just thanks so much yeah for... absolutely i got about 10 minutes so i'm good cool well before i ask you the... well i'll throw in a couple of more fun ones then what's the best advice you've ever gotten huh um let me think about that I don't know. I've gotten a lot of really good <laughs> advice. I think some of the, you know, some of the like the better advice is is really like um shit. That's a good question. Well, okay, here's one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I briefly <laughs> this this is not going to be helpful to anyone, but. Uh, <laughs> I briefly, uh, so I, I, in between management and uh, joining uh, a, a festival production company, Hookah, um, uh, I, for about a year and a half, I was at an ad agency. And um, like my first week there, um, I went on a business trip and um, my boss at the time was like, was like, look, let me give you one piece of advice. When you're on a business trip, 
order the expensive meals. <laughs> you know, like, don't get uh, the burger and fries. And, and, <laughs> yeah, don't get the burger and fries. Go for the steak. It's not your money. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I would bring that one with me. Um, I mean, I think like ultimately the best advice that, you know, I've kind of like come to that I can give to other people that has maybe been like a theme through a lot of what I've done is like, it's kind of what we touched on before is like, um, find out like what, like what works for you and drives you. And even if it's like impossibly niche, just own that mm -hmm. and be like, be like absolutely excellent at that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I don't know if anybody's ever told me that, but it's been kind of like a, like a culmination of like, you know, things, me learning about things I'm good and not good at, and then mm -hmm. just like really trying to be phenomenal at the things that, uh, that I am good at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, focus on the strengths, right? Um, it's funny when you said the the steak thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, I think I think came to mind. So when I was working at AEG as a as a production manager, they covered our meals, right? So we're traveling all over the state or the southeast mm -hmm. region, and when, wherever we go to eat, like we the company covers that. And we had this new production manager that started right before you know, the, the furloughs and layoffs happened. Um, he would always eat really like cheap. And I was mm. like, dude, you're making me look bad, bro. Like, <laughs> go eat a steak or some fish at least once a week. Cause if your expense reports are coming in so little and mine are coming in with steak and fish, like, you're making us look bad, man. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think like I've, you know, I, I typically pre COVID, I travel, you know, twice a month or so for, for different work, for work and, um, and all my past jobs, I've traveled, you know, a pretty decent amount too. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to travel for work, like take advantage of it. Like no matter what work you have, I would always wake up, you know, at the crack of dawn and go do something that's fun in the city that I've never been before. Even yeah. if that makes me tired at the end of the day. Um, worth it. Just worth it. hundred percent. Totally worth it. Yeah. Is, and then on the opposite of good advice, is there a common bad advice you hear often given in our industries? For example, one that I, you don't hear as much anymore, but you used to always hear independent, like people tell independent artists, like you have to go on the road and build your career on the road, which is mm -hmm. so horrible in today's world. But is there anything like that, that you, you often hear? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it goes back to this argument that Bowen and I had four years ago. You don't have to be a <laughs> dick to make it in the music industry. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's there's a lot of really weird dynamics in the music industry, honestly, um, uh, and particularly in live music, um, because that's a world that I know best where, you know, you have like agents and promoters and top buyers like yelling at each other and like mm -hmm. it's, this aggro like ego thing and like, you know, everybody, the agent assistant or the tour marketer has to yell at the venue marketer right. and it's like, like, no dude, like, you know, I'm going to pick up the phone and call you and like, realize that we're not like you're not mad at me i'm not mad at you we're trying to go for the same thing right. and um and anybody who thinks otherwise i think there's a lot of like very um there's a lot of like toxic culture that i see um uh you know even beyond kind of like this very like negative uh this like negative vibes. Like I see there's a lot of misogyny, I think in the music industry mm -hmm. um, and things like that. Um, and none of it makes you better, <laughs> you know, like right. just, just because that's the way that things had been or whatever it is. Um, just because like this agent uh, talent buyer dynamic has always been like really tenuous and kind of weird um, or whatever, like that's not the right way to do things. We're all going for the same thing. This mm -hmm. industry is small. Who knows where everybody will end up we all want to you know make money and have a good time and throw a party for people so yeah i love that i really love that um and I've, maybe it's the positive optimistic side of me but I, I feel like it's changing like i feel like it's it's getting 100%. better a lot of the old school uh, is going away here's what i've realized that like um you take take off that like that surface of like really ugliness like ultimately we're very few people uh, are in this to make money. And if they are, they're in the wrong industry yeah. um, for sure. Yeah. And so like you meet some genuinely cool people because they're in it for the right reasons, um, especially in that, like, you know, in the lower middle, even like, you know, semi upper tiers of things like people are just, uh, a, there's a lot of great music fans. There's a lot of people who are willing to work really hard and are incredibly smart. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as a side note, you know, that's one of the things I'm most worried about as fallout from from COVID. But like, um, 
but just the people are so genuine and I do agree with you. I think, I think it's changing. There's, yeah. you know, absolutely. Yeah. And before I ask you the last question uh, to ask everyone, just thanks so much for, for finally, fi or I was, I was both, both of us finding a time to do this and for <laughs> sharing uh, so much about you know, just make great marketing tips and sh sharing about what you guys are doing at the venue. I feel like people can learn a lot from this and I'm, I'm excited to share with everyone. So thanks for, for your awesome, time. Man. I'm so happy. Yeah. It was a great conversation. I'm, I was wondering how we would, fill the time but like there's so much more to talk about and you know i have so many more notes <laughs> <Probably another hour. laughs> but um yeah. yeah thanks so much again and, and a question i ask everyone at the end is what's your definition of making it yeah absolutely i think uh yeah that's 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 changed a lot uh through my life i think when like i was um a little bit younger or like i was like you know here's here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be in this for three years. I'm going to get go from manager to director, and then I'm going to go from director and I'm going to go work for a big corporation or whatever. Uh, you know, at this point, I kind of have like a couple of things going for me. Um, and, you know, I, I have my own company, uh, Valmont, which, you know, is, a, which I work with large events. I have White Oak Music Hall. Um, I work with these guys, wristband. I have a uh, software Sparrow. And I think like, ultimately particularly for like this industry um like making it is just like about really enjoying what you're doing every day like no matter like no matter what and whether or not like and and also i mean i think also like the second part of that is figuring out how the thing that you enjoy makes a sustainable living for you you know and i think that's like those two things i don't want to like preach that oh as long as you're happy and passionate everything's all good but i think the um the really interesting dynamic there is like how do you take that like how do you take you know something like mike mauer like strategy and uh data and analytics and he can apply it to a lot of things but he also likes music and how do I parlay that into, you know, a sustainable career where I'm doing a lot of different things. And as long as I'm applying that to, um, you know, to whatever I do, like I'm going to be motivated and happy. And I think that's the people that I see, um, you know, it's, it's, it sounds really cliche to say, and I hate to say it, but it sounds like it's, uh, you know, it's not about your title or anything like that it's just about like knowing what you want, knowing what you like, um, and figuring out how to turn that into like a, a sustainable income and, um, and just like enjoying it every single day and living your life. That's, that's pretty much doesn't get better than that. Live the life you love.